So um, I would also like to thank our sponsors, Zach Moss for their continual support, Hello. and uh, Gavin Goldfish for the venue host, and also Australian Embassy for supporting us every time for our <laughs> alumni program. And um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you also to uh, Simon, VIP Global. Please give a warm welcome to Simon, who will be our moderator for <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, I'm Simon Osborne, I'm the Group Managing Director for AIP uh, Global. We're a social enterprise, a multi-corporate social enterprise that's focused on student development. Um, just to give you a brief background on, on the story of how we, we started um, this whole discussion here, it was Rochelle and, and one of my team, Fabian, they got together and they said, well, how about you come and do a talk on, on alumni study? I'm like, I, I'm too lazy, I don't like talking, <laughs> honestly. Uh, so I have our panel discussion, because if it's a monologue, then we're just, it's just me talking a lot, you know, and yet I don't think there's a lot of value in that. So instead we decided to have, uh, have a panel discussion where, where there's a lot more value um, in that, because it's more of an intrinsic or a holistic discussion involved here. Um, so that's why we put together this panel here, made, made up of various different backgrounds and experts. Uh, and I'm so honoured to have them here tonight and I need to be moderating. Uh, Oscham Aus and uh, Australian alumni, we, we all share the same vision and that's trying to provide a better experience to the user and the consumer. And so that's how we managed to be uh, doing this panel discussion tonight. I'm trying to obviously draw out questions from our guests, uh, our judges, judges, sorry, our panellists. <laughs> They're not judges. Um, I'm trying to draw out things that, that you can't find on Google, okay? Because otherwise, why bother coming? Um, so um, keep your questions in mind. Um, I'm going to have half an hour of uh, discussions here, uh, and then I'll turn it over to you guys, and hopefully you'll have some questions of your own as well. Uh, so let me introduce you to the, to the panel tonight here. I'll start over in that corner. Uh, Mr. Barry from Uber, he's the expansion manager. Now, Barry, um, you brought Uber to Melbourne, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah do you want yeah, to? Yeah, I Why, I'm sure you have a lot of taxi people that hate you there, right? Um, yes, godfather of e-commerce. So in the internet years, that means I've been here for four years. But working in the region for 10 years. And yes, we do only e-commerce. We love e-commerce. We live, breathe, and eat, and sleep e-commerce. And we have 17 companies in the region now, in seven countries. 
uh, and most of our focus has always been in Thailand. So my team are based here, but we're active in the region. And we have a couple of companies that have really just exploded in growth. Uh, our biggest is here in Thailand, two years old, 900 people. So it gives you an idea of the scale. So a quick plug, if you want to do anything in e-commerce, come see the Godfather. <laughs> Chances are here to quiet you. <laughs> Okay, the next person, she just le literally landed off the plane from Bali uh, to recharge herself, right? Uh, and, and, and now I'm going to call her the godmother of medical tourism. <laughs> Cassandra! <laughs> um, so I came to Thailand 11 years ago, uh, fresh out of university, and I, I came backpacking actually. And I studied forensic science, so after one year of travelling, my plan was to go back to Melbourne and uh, get into the police force. But uh, I arrived here and fell in love with the lifestyle and the people and the culture, and I started a medical tourism company. And now what I'm trying to do is digitise that experience that I've had over the past nine years. And uh, I've created, well, we're, our team is creating a platform for medical tourists to uh, connect with a doctor abroad, book an appointment and book their travel, creating a, a seamless experience for the medical tourist. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, the next person, uh, again, most of you probably have this in your kitchen. Uh, my mum likes to shove it down my throat, the fish oil and that. Um, Blackmore, uh, I, I wants to be like Mark Zuckerberg, uh, but they, they, they don't obviously look at the hard work involved get there. So what would you say to those kids? It took me nine years to purchase my car, so <laughs> it, 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 it you know, took some time. Yeah. And uh, I don't think you have, I mean, I, a lot of people would be much quicker for a lot of people. I, I had several failures, but uh, it would take a lot of time and a lot more effort than most people would imagine. Mm -hmm. it, well, that was my, my case anyway. Anyone want to add anything to that? For me, I think that uh, speak out from the, your corporate life, in my opinion, Sales. I think that one of the key uh, qualification of entrepreneurship is also for Thai need to be like you know marketable. I think that Thai people is uh, quite shy and not assertive now. So uh, uh, many many of people like have a smart idea and really good, but they are not uh, presentable. They are not marketable. So uh, that probably will limit you know uh, Thai entrepreneurship to uh, other you know uh, country. Um, going on that question, actually, moving on from there, fast over. Um, Ernst and Young. I, I recently read an article from Ernst and Young. Um, they're they're, they're going to get rid of the degree uh, hiring procedure there. So they're they're saying that um, academic success doesn't necessarily correlate to working success or, or life success. So do, do you guys agree? Do you guys agree? I most definitely agree. I mean, my degree is in forensic science. It's not really has anything to do with what I'm related to. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, having a business degree would be helpful, I'm sure, but there's so many resources available. And uh, I think with, you just have to have the mindset and like Adrian said, the passion to want to create something I think I'm probably the worst example of a wasted time at university. I spent 10 years as a Monash grad and walked out of there with an MD degree. So I'm utterly unqualified for what I do for a living. I'm not sure if I should be proud of that, but it's a really good example. Your passions at the end of the day will trump whatever you study, science, engineering, medicine, law. I have friends who are brilliant entrepreneurs who are reformed lawyers direct scientists, your passion will always win. So, does that mean I don't need to go to university? Because I have a lot of passion? What do you want to do? It's <laughs> 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 open, open up. <laughs> do you want to add anything, Barry? Sure. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I think the world of, of entrepreneurship is it's very much uh, like figuring out as you go. And um, you know, so yes, like you need to be super driven um, and be uh, be a really good uh, problem solver. And I think you know, the world of, of academia, it, it 
uh, it uh, sets you up to be uh, generally an expert in something and you kind of operate in a very theoretical world that, which may not actually be the case um, uh, you know, in reality. And, and, and so like, I, I think uh, you know, ha having some of the, the foundations of academia can help um, to conduct my business and something like that. Um, but then you, I feel like the, the true learning really starts when you, when you actually get out there into, into the real world. Uh, where you and can, it stops. and it never stops. That's absolutely true. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Kevin. Um, but I mean, as as Adrian would probably tell you himself, I mean, there are tools now. I mean, for instead of uh, for for entrepreneurs, instead of, instead of going to universities, you can go to uh, incubators and accelerators, and uh, those tend to gear more towards uh, you know in, in, uh, fostering fostering this um, entrepreneurship and growth. You mentioned that, so I mean, like, does that make universities redundant? Because now you have Google, right? You can almost self-teach yourself. So um, why why would you go and spend you know thousands of dollars uh, to do it to, to get a piece of paper when you could maybe just learn it yourself? I think you can't underestimate the importance of the socialization and life that happens there. You can't go from being a teenager at high school into the real world. So your kind of safety blanket is called university. If you do it well, you have a fantastic time, you make lifelong friends, you learn skills for the rest of your life. And that happens irrespective of the specific degree. But I highly recommend that anyone go to university and it doesn't matter what you study, do it for the experience. Yeah, and I think to add on that is also like, you know, university uh, teach you about you know, mediation and also, you know, have a discipline also. That is, uh, I think, uh, one of the uh, factors to be a successful entrepreneur uh, also. Um, failure. I want to talk about failure. What does that mean? Um, have, have you failed? Do you consider you know, the things you've done a failure or, or what? <laughs> <laughs> With my own money, yes. <laughs> um, when you lose, you know, a whole year's worth of sleep, uh, yes, yes. Uh, and there are times when you wish you could have gone back and uh, redo things. And I see a lot of uh, literature that says, you know, to fail is, you know, like a pathway to success. But I really think that it would be better if you were smarter and you hadn't failed in the first place. <laughs> it takes much longer time. Right. So does that mean don't, don't even try? I don't know, I mean like, uh, just be smart and try. Like just learn from, learn from people who have tried. Adrian, I, I want your opinion on, on trailer. You, I mean, you mentioned that. Yeah, so that, I'm gonna turn that question around and say, <laughs> the biggest things I have not learned from were my successes, because clearly I'm a genius and this all happened because I did everything right. Now the reality is, and this is painful personal experience, the first three things that I did were all massive successes because I was in the right place at the right time. A smart monkey could have done what I did and probably done better. But it was really a tremendous line of successes, two IPOs and an exit to Microsoft. And then I'm invincible and I raise a ton of money and I lose everything. I stand in front of a team of almost 100 people and fire them all, including myself. And it's at that point that you realize that it doesn't matter what you do, your timing has to be right, the team has to be right, the market has to be right. So I really turned that around. My biggest mistake was not learning from the successes and being humble because of that and taking that kind of respect for the world that's around you into the next deal. Because at some point it is gonna come and bite you in the butt. So keeping a, keeping attached to reality. Yeah, 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 but especially that. like we're in a very similar market here. We're in a rising tides market. So as long as you don't screw things up, you're going to be okay. So that is not always the case. We are in a very, very, very lucky point in time, and it will not last. Interesting, you mentioned that. Then I mean, you're going on onto that, uh, and, and you're obviously riding that that, work, that that wave of success right now. How do you stay current? I mean, with e-commerce, for instance, you know, there's a, the wave has come from Europe. So. It's really easy. Hire people that are smarter than you are. Okay. <laughs> um, Barry, I wanted to 
ask that question to you. Uber, you know, they're everywhere. Taxi mafia, right? How, how, how do you stay? How do you stay current? How do you stay innovative? Um, so, you know, we we are very uh, customer centric. Like we we are always looking to you know bit to we have two customers. Uh, we have the driver and we have and we have the rider. Uh, most people don't don't kind of think about the other side of the business, which is the driver. Um, but we are constantly getting feedback from both of our customers. Um, you know, be it through like social media, like be it through uh, support lines, um, be it through just normal, you know, uh, normal mainstream media. Uh, you know, going to with our with our drivers, like sure, like through support lines, through um, through events that we hold. It, 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 we're just constantly getting that feedback. Um, so that that's to make sure that we are. Uh, fill in the needs um, of our customers, and we can do that, uh, you know, uh, actively. And then the other side, of course, is like just the industry itself. Um, and uh, I think that we have we have a very clear vision on what it is that we want to achieve. Um, it's it's not about Uber versus taxi. It's actually about Uber versus car ownership. And um, you know, and so when you have a very very clear message of what it is that you're trying to trying to achieve, yeah, then you look at those factors, like uh, you know, what 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 are the behaviors around uh, car ownership and, and and things like that, and how. You know, how do we, how do we, uh, you know, innovate and keep improving and make make Uber the 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 best option to get around? Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, so I, I, out of all of us here, I guess the the person who is the oldest company, more than more than twenty years old, is this complicity at Blackmores. So how, how do you how are you still around after twenty years? <laughs> I think Memo have been in Thailand 20 years ago, right? And uh, the first business uh, is established by uh, Thai people. That actually, uh, Mr. Marcus uh, told that story to us that, you know, uh, she had to uh, fly over to uh, Sydney and uh, we had the brand more products and she liked uh, the product very much. I think it could be good for Thailand also. So she brought the product to Thailand and established the business here. And I think uh, the business has been built by trust. You know, uh, with both you know that lady and also uh, Mr. Marcus, the owner of the brand malls. So uh, it's since then that you know um, the company have really you know look at Thailand as uh, the first business out of Australia that you know uh, um, be something that you know if uh, nothing uh, from the beginning, but it's because of trust that the company have built up for. Then I think that uh, Thailand have contributed, you know, have contributed. Thailand is still the like, number one market uh, out of Australia right now. So and, um, not just only in terms of the sales, but it's also in terms of profit that uh, we generate back to uh, the group also. Uh, more and more, I think the market trend in Thailand in terms of health and beauty is also growing. The market is growing right now like about you know uh, about 7 to 10 percent these years. Uh, but back more have been growing like double digit uh, since then. So, um, only like last year, that uh, last two years, that economy is quite uh, uh, have some trouble, so it has been a slow down, but it uh, starting to pick up already this year. So um, yeah, so so uh, and Thailand is also like the hub of uh, the uh, the, uh, the Indochina. Like uh, we are starting to build Thailand to be uh, the hub to entry to those countries uh, very soon also. And uh, more on that is about you know manufacturing that uh, is also a plan that uh, we have our, uh, manufacturing outside Australia also very soon. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to turn the questions over then to you guys now. Um, otherwise, it's just me talking all the time. Getting bored of that. But so uh, Rochelle and, and Alex, I think I can walk around with some mics. So have you got any questions that you want to draw uh, out of these guys? Strap. Don't be shy. Here we go, one at the front. Okay, thank you. So I think you're sort of leading the pie, because uh, I knew that. Just to recap the question so everyone can hear, Cassandra started from nothing. We need to go back over the lot of one year, basically. Can you summarize? <laughs> um, so after back in Asia, 
I came home and said, Mum, Dad, can I borrow ten thousand dollars? Start a business. And they freaked out initially, but um, they they believed in me and they supported me. Uh, so I, initially, I incorporated the company in Australia. Uh, but whilst it was incorporated there, I, I lived here, or I was flying back and forth a lot. And uh, I started with just one, two, three people traveling abroad a month, and then 50, 100, 150. I nearly lost the business when we had the red shirts, in, no, the yellow shirts, when the airport closed, and I, I nearly went bankrupt. And then again, with the uh, red shirts, the flooding, the flooding nearly killed me. Uh, and then bounced back in 2013, uh, I started going through an acquisition or due diligence with NIV, health insurance. And I spent a year, um, the CEO of NIV was flying to Thailand, they wanted to acquire 49% of my company. I would, when 28 years old, they offered me $2 million for 49%. Uh, um, he, I, um, I was still late. They were. I had a five-year contract, uh, five hundred thousand dollar a year salary, and it got to the end of doing that due diligence, and NIV said, "Okay, we've got everything we need now. We're going to start our own uh, medical travel business called NIV Options." Um, so after that, that that lost all my confidence and it was like, okay, what am I gonna do? That they have my business plan, they have my all my ideas, all my contacts, everything. You know, they, I had to share everything during that one year. So um, that's how Top Docs came about. I started talking to customers again and find, trying to find out what is it that people want, how I can really help them with their medical travel journey. And that's when I started learning about tech. And because my business was a traditional business, so it's not really scalable. So that's when I started learning about, um, yeah, getting involved in, in tech. And, and now I... Now you're, you're a psychopath. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I always was a psychopath. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Any next questions? Okay, there we go. We've got one, one, one right there. Could you state, state your name and, and a question? Can you hear me? Yeah. I am Seba. Seba, how? Um, I, I read a lot about uh, entrepreneurship and I'm visiting that kind of events. And usually, uh, if you run into a very specific situation, which means you have a problem to solve, which you believe in, but the circumstances of your market or your, or, or your location, um, prevent you from going for the, the solution you thought might work for that. Now, can someone give me an example when that happened to him or her, and then and how they how they went around it, or how they how they solved it? Okay, so to re-emphasize Stefan's point, um, you're passionate about something, and you've hit a roadblock. How do you go around that? I'll give you a really quick, real example. So I think everyone here knows it's Sogo, the group buying business. It's big in Thailand, it's the biggest player in the region. That's one of our previous companies. And it had a really, really bad beginning. We opened up in Singapore on a Monday. By Wednesday, there were five other competitors in the market. By Friday, we had shut down and left. So sometimes it's just not worth finding a battle that you're gonna lose. So either change yourself or change the environment, but finding a losing battle, life's too short. Any, any further comments on that? Pivoting, I guess, we're gonna leave startup, right? Well, actually, this was running away. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be the quickest startup and, and leave, right? By in one, moment, in one week. <laughs> uh, next question, you, you have a question? Yeah. I'm not you. Come <laughs> <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, my name is Fabian. I'm a colleague of Simon, obviously. Um, my question is mostly directed towards um, Barry and Adrian, probably, since you both highlighted the importance of human capital and 
well have businesses that expanded and scaled up really fast. So I'm wondering when exactly is the point that you decide to invest into new human capital? When do you decide to hire new people to your company to take this kind of growth path? What do you have to do for that? Good question. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, at Uber, um, we, we, we tend to grow very quickly. Um, and uh, part, of, part of the way that we can do that is um, we've been able to develop some really good tools uh, that, that allow us to get, get more and more efficient. Um, you know what, like, we, we have, like, these kind of, like, headcount projections and stuff like this, like, based on the size of the business. And, and um, you know, we, we are always looking to, to find new talent and, and, and good talent. Um, and that's probably one of the hardest things uh, you know, in my experience, is, is to is to find a good talent, not just not just smart talent, um, like was, like was pointed out earlier, but uh, you know, really driven talent as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so I don't know if that, that quite like answers your question, um, but we're always looking for always looking for for new talent because um, that's probably the the hardest thing to to grow. Where where do you look for new talent? Um, you know, it's uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of referrals, so a lot of kind of like, you know our networks. That's that's uh, generally number one uh, where it comes from. Uh, but, you know, events like this, uh, getting out and about, and um, you know saying good day and uh, sharing our story and telling everybody that there are some exciting opportunities um, is another one. Uh, and then also like our you know our our writer base is actually a really good uh, uh, good source of, of talent as well. Thank you. <coughs> If I can add to that, I think the, the sort of fundamental question you're asking is scaling. When do you know whether you should scale? So a lot of what we do from the outside looks crazy risky. We go into a market, we hire up a lot of people, and people look at this and go, what gives you the confidence? Are you insane or do you know something that we don't? And the answer is generally that we know something that they don't. So we're very data driven. I'll give you a real example. Indonesia, crazy complex big market, way behind Thailand. Except at the end of last year, we could see the growth, the initial rumblings, the numbers were looking good. So we completely overinvested on the assumption that sometime next year Indonesia would catch up. It caught up in June this year. So in hindsight, it looks like a really good decision. At the time, it's hugely risky. If we're too early, we lose our shirts, we fire 100 people. If we're too late, we don't keep up with the growth. So the more data you have, the better. Just don't tell anyone. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, next question for you first, yeah. Yeah. Um, the question is, what is the trigger that makes you sell the baby? Trigger the what? Makes you sell. Makes you the trigger yeah, that makes most entrepreneurs, especially if you've got funding, at some point if there's an exit event forced by your capital guys or something. What is it that makes you not lose the passion, but say now is the time to let it go? Oh, okay. You mean exit? Okay. So who, who's, who wants to answer that? Who, who's going to exit? <laughs> I'll give you a very quick philosophical answer. I think, no, this is a really important question and I think it depends on where you are in your own life journey. The first business you do, I recommend you sell early. Because making a million dollars is a fundamentally life-changing thing because it allows you to take risk. If you know you've got a roof over your head and you know you can eat ramen noodles for two years, your behavior is fundamentally different. If you can get a couple of your friends to come eat ramen noodles with you and you pay basic salaries, you have the nucleus of a seriously big business. You cannot do that if you're worried about what you're going to eat tomorrow. So my advice to young entrepreneur is go out a little bit earlier the first time because the second time round, you don't need to deal with greedy VCs. You don't need to worry about any of that stuff. You're not stressing out about what you do next. Then you go for the 100 million plus exit. Because Cassandra, you, you had that story, right? You, you, you sold, did you? No, I didn't. No, you didn't sell, right. Why? <laughs> <laughs> do I really have to say that? <laughs> 
the, the, the deal the deal fell through. All right. Okay. So, um, but now as a um, where we're at with Top Dot, so I'm bootstrapping. I'm self-funded, and uh, investors have approached me and and have offered money, but I'm trying to avoid that uh, for as long as possible. Um, I want to pr prove the business first, and also the quicker, the sooner I take money, then the less, the, the lower the valuation. So um, at the moment, I do plan to raise seed capital, but probably not till March next year. Um, at the moment, we're doing really well, we're, we're generating revenue. Um, so that, that's what we're focused on at the moment, just building a really good product. Yeah, hi, my name's Greg Wallace. I'm from the Australian Embassy in Bangkok, so I'm probably from the, the least entrepreneurial sector you'll find <laughs> since I work for government. Um, but my question is about um, when you got started, each of you, that um, did you, you know, did you think that because you're in an entrepreneurial business, was it was it the passion that overrode the thought about developing a rational business plan to make something successful? In other words, if, if you thought too much about developing a, a, a conventional business plan about how you would make this business succeed, do you think that would have impeded you from ever doing what you're doing because it was only the passion that really got you there? Passion. Passion. Well, when, when I first uh, started my company, I, the Australian government had a program called the New Enterprise Initiative Scheme, and they basically said that I can't remember what the statistic was exactly, but it was very high. It was about 50% of businesses fail because they don't have a business plan. So part of this scheme that the government was offering was, okay, we're going to teach you how to create a business plan. And then they gave you a mentor and I think it was funding a small amount of daily living assistance or weekly living assistance so that you could focus on just creating, starting the business. But but now in tech, it's very much, no, no you don't have a business plan. It's it's about um, what we, it's a methodology, leads methodology where it's all about you know, uh, building a product and testing it, um, build med, uh, measure test. And so it's very much, they say, don't don't have a business plan at all. Um, but we, we, I guess it's different with, um, a startup in that we have a roadmap, but not so much a, a strict business plan that you need to follow like like I did when I first started. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I think what's changed is we now have real methodologies for doing startups. So we don't do business plans either, but we have a very clear, it's a lean process, lean startup methodology that allows you to fail fast and learn fast, but not with a business plan. Thank you. Okay. Any Next one, yep, over here. <coughs> I, I had, a, I had a, just a, an anecdote because I, I'm not in a, a tech uh, industry actually. Uh, I started with a business that I have absolutely no passion for. Um, and that is a, um, I, I put together a fund, I'm a, I'm a finance trainer, uh, uh, and I put together a fund to buy this building uh, because it, was, it, it belonged to my grandfather and uh, he was getting sick and uh, we had no one to, to look after it. It was kind of getting dilapidated. Um, so we, we put a fund together, mostly family money and the banks, uh, banks were 80% bank loan, uh, to buy this building and to take it off his hand and to manage it for him. So it wasn't a passion as much as it's kind of just, um, I don't want him to wake up uh, and, and you know uh, be worried that he couldn't pay back the bank. Um, but then everything else that came from it, um, this, uh, you know, Adelaide Hotel, um, the hospitality side of things, there are all things that I found a way to, to do anyway out of, um, you know, the, the, the kind of like, basically we got these investors together, family mostly, and everyone said they want to be in office buildings, they just want to have like an old um, traditional fund uh, to go and grab and buy more, more assets. And I've, uh, over the years, convinced them to invest more and more into uh, newer types of businesses and eventually became became a passion. Serendipity, you could say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you had a question? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, I'm, I'm on here. 
<coughs> okay, I would like to have the question about uh, the entrepreneur cannot do alone. Yeah. How do you find a team to do it? And the professional, how do you do manage it? Something like that. Uh, in terms of finding resource yeah. or a co-founder? The team who have the same passion to mm -hmm. go along with you, something like that. Okay, so I'm motivating a team. Cassandra, you, you probably know more about this, right? Yeah, that's my biggest challenge is uh, trying to find so I initially I, need, I knew I needed to find a co-founder, uh, someone who's experienced in tech, and it, it, it's really it's really difficult. I put ads on founders to be in Angel's List and LinkedIn and reached out to my network and and it, your co-founder is it's it's like a marriage. So you really need to find someone that um, has the same passion as you do and you. You know your personality. You would need to be able to, because I, I like to argue, and um, I went through quite a few CTOs initially, <laughs> quite a few. Um, so yeah, trying to find people that uh, to be to be in your team is, is is really hard. And you, when you do find that people, you have to um, get them on board as and be as, as interested and and want to be a part of of your ideas and really see that you're building something that's worthwhile and, and they want to be a part of it. You've got to get them excited about your idea as well. So it is, it is difficult, um, <laughs> but you just have to be unstoppable. Yeah, and then, yeah, do you want to counter Yeah, no, 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 I think that's a, that's a good idea. I just have an example. I, just have, I know that's I, I have an example, PJ, PJ, hello. <laughs> can, can you stand up, please? <laughs> I'm just going to tell everyone how I found you. Um, because uh, I, I was looking for a community manager uh, for Goldfish. And uh, because I'm, I'm a, quite an introverted person, I don't have an Instagram account, and I just don't like talking to people. Um, so I need like a, a person to counteract that on the team. Um, the way I found him was, uh, he, uh, PJ, you had a business in Super 26. Uh, it was a uh, backyard, yes. backyard. Um, and he's managed to get everyone together and create a small niche community there. Um, and his second project uh, he has in uh, um, in Zilong. Uh, and he came to me and said, look, I have this building, and I would like a service office in it. Uh, you know, what do you think? Would you recommend that I, that I, uh, that I build this here? And I said, no. I would not recommend that, but I would instead recommend that you come and join me and help us build a certain office in Siam. And so that's how it helped. You're not going to leave any time soon, right? <laughs> um, Barry, uh, you're looking for a country manager for who? Interested. <laughs> how, how are you going to go about that? I think you answered the question. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, we we have had. So how are we going to go about it? It's just um, you know, go to the top of the hills and uh, and and shout as loud as we can and let everybody know that hey, there, there's this, this fantastic opportunity. Um, I think for anybody that knows Uber and like knows like the uh, the potential that that we've seen in other markets, this is a fairly young market, um, and so the potential here is absolutely outrageous. And we're only in the first city, so there'll be so much more. Um, but yeah, so I guess it's really sharing that, sharing that story, and like sharing like the uh, the opportunity that, that there is to find one. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you guys know anyone, I'd love to <laughs> love to chat to them. If anybody's keen in this room, I'd love to chat to you tonight. Do you have any time? Uh, it's you. You don't have to be. Um, I, my uh, yeah. If you uh, if you if you're passionate about um, about startups, you're passionate about growing something. Um, at, at a speed that you never thought you could, um, and you know you know about obviously about Thailand and about the markets here. Um, I'd love to chat to you and say you have to be tough. There you go. I got someone yeah. earlier. I can get rid of. It works for me. I don't like it anymore. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, next question. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, just kind of following on from that question about uh, teams and founders, um, do you need a co-founder? Um, like, what's I guess what's what's the difference? I mean, I know there's lots of differences, 
business, but do you need someone to, to go half house with you in a business and kind of work together? Can you do it by yourself? Mm -hmm. Good question. Do you need a co-founder? I can tell you categorically yes, for psychological reasons. You need someone when everything goes to hell to support you. You need someone to bounce ideas off. This is the hardest thing you will ever do. Doing it by yourself is a recipe for sadness, unhappiness, loneliness, and depression. So take someone on that journey with you. What about a psychiatrist? <laughs> no, it's way more fun with two people. Does it? Yeah, I made my first business I, I did on my own, but now having a co-founder, you're able to bounce off them. Um, good ideas come out of disagreeing. Um, and it, it, it does, it, I hate it because I want to make the decision, but it, I've, it's definitely more supportive having a co-founder. Investors tend to not look at startups or sole founders. They prefer, they, they're interested in, in the team. So from an investor's point of view, it, it's better to have a co-founder as well. Thank you. Um, probably one last question. Yep. Uh, thank you. My name is Chad. I'm just going back a couple of questions. I'm talking to, if I understand correctly, uh, Dr. Adrian would be both on the funding side and some other people are uh, entrepreneurs. So the question applies equally. We all, as we all know, 20 years ago it was about a business plan and you take that to the bank. And now we know that the current state of play is a pitch deck and that's a lean model. But in particular, my question to you, maybe in rough percentage terms, would be, what sort of, um, what is the funding situation, say in a pre-seed or a seed situation, in terms where is a pitch deck sufficient or do you still need a business plan or say pre-seed or seed type funding? Thank you. Do you need a business plan or pitch deck? Are you going to pitch no, or? Or, right. So it depends on the state pitching. If you're pitching a seed stage investor, then you may not need either of those things. Once you get to series A, you probably should have both of them. So it depends where you are. What we look for typically is, is the idea good? That's kind of the get in the door requirement. And then we really look at how big is your market? If it's big enough, then we look at can the team go in there? And that's really kind of where you stop. Everything else can and will change. So whatever you're pitching today will be different tomorrow. So that, those are the two key things. How big is the market and how good is the team? Everything else is negotiable. Can I have a side thought? I said, Dr. Weiss, would you care to put any numbers to that, for the C, P, C on that basis level? Like, and in terms of dollar amounts yes, that go in? Yes. Yeah, so, so what we typically do at seed stage is we invest a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And traditionally, that used to come in as equity. It's now mostly coming in as convertible notes, which is better for you as an entrepreneur. Less dilution, typically, and much faster to do. So if you need to raise the first 200 to 500, it's reasonably straightforward. Lots of money in Singapore, harder out here, but still very doable. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Sorry. What is a convertible note? So the two main ways you can fund your business. The first is you value your business, let's say it's worth a million dollars, and you sell me 10%, and I put in 100,000, and now your company's worth 1.1 million, and I own roughly 9% post that event. So that's equity, I own a piece. That takes a lot of paperwork, negotiation, shareholders agreements, stock purchase agreements, subscription agreement, blah, blah, blah. Painful, difficult lawyers get rich. The other option is a convertible note where I say, I will give you $100,000, and what you do is you promise me that in future, when you do an equity round, you will guarantee me that I participate and you will give me a discount on that round. So it's very easy to negotiate because we're not agreeing on price. We're not involving lawyers. You can download one of these from the internet. Um, and we're deferring them till the future. So much faster and easier for you. Not so good for me, great for you. Answer the question. Yep, one at the back. Hello, I'm Nick. Um, I'll be very quick. 
in a month, about a month and a half, uh, AEC comes to life. So fingers crossed, right? Yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. And just like Europe now, they're building walls after what happened here. They're gonna break down. So you know, they're gonna pretty much have a free flow of people, goods, and you know, everything that happened in Europe back in the early '90s happens here in 2016. What does change for, if any, for your business? for anything that you're going to be approaching starting January 1st. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So AEC is opening up. How, how will that shape your business in the future? Anyone want to? I've been talking too much, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, wait. How, how about complicity? Do you have? You see, still be both uh, opportunity and challenge for Brad Moss. In terms of opportunity, it's like it's open the uh, offer the avenue that we can go to uh, the Indochina that I mentioned first, and then um, I also see that it will be uh, draw a lot of investment both uh, from you know internal and external, and that help in terms of economy of the country, and that of course you know bring uh, higher processing power back to Thailand, and it's good for the business. But the challenge is also like you know uh, how um, speed that uh, Thailand uh, can you know integrate it, you know all the benefit of that BBC too. Um, I think that uh, we have been talking about this for years, and actually it should be like you know uh, implemented by the end of this year, but it's still not much happening, you know. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're probably on time, right? Is that right? Yeah. Do you think I can get one in quickly? You probably know this as well, but, but I wanted to know when does a startup stop being a startup? <laughs> Never. Never. It's just my my question. I can ask you guys later in your opinion if you don't want to have if you don't have anything to share. No? But now is probably time to go to network, um, so you guys can have a chance to ask. Sorry. Picture. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to hand it back over now. Yeah, well, thank you for a very convincing discussion and thank you for a um, very good question from the audience. So um, I guess we just conclude the panel discussion so everyone can get a chance to talk directly with the panel outside. And if you have your retreat voucher, you can use them at the bar. And if I can ask the panelists to stay here for pictures, please. Thank you. Thank you. I have um, one more announcement. Um, we forgot to ask you to put your business cards in the bowl outside. Make sure you do because uh, you have the chance to win a Blackmore's big hamper um, for the door price. So make sure you put your business card. Actually, and one, one more last last announcement. Um, the uh, the Oxfam alumni subcommittee are actually looking for members to join the committee. So if you want to get involved in alumni activities, just come to speak to us. Thank you. This one.